So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this Sunday, this new date. From now on, everything will be on a Sunday. Um, many thanks to our two presenters. Really looking forward to this. And many thanks to our organizers, curators, Ju Judith Joseph and Dorit Jordan Dotan, with the help of Chesel and Amado and Hannah Wiesenthal, alias. Back to the curators. All right, so welcome to the third edition uh, of the Jewish Arts and Non Open Studios online programs. The next program will be Sunday, September 5th at noon Eastern time. Featured artists will be Joel Silverstein, Lana Kurtz, and Jacob Jenin, or Genin, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Today we will present Ellen Holzblatt and Leah Rabb in a video by William Kentridge. Links to their website are in the chat. Please type the questions into the chat. Our first presenter is Ellen Holzblatt, a Chicago-based artist, creates paintings and drawings to explore connections between physical and the spiritual, the memories of the body that reside in the soul. Her work becomes an allegory on psyche and emotion, evolution, and decay. Holzblatt exhibits her work across the United States and internationally. Recent group exhibits include the Jerusalem Biennale, Museum of Biblical Art in New York, and many other places. She has been awarded artist residencies in the US and abroad. After Ellen's presentations, we will show a short video created by artist William Kentridge. Second reading, his work connecting the two presentations by Ellen and Leah and emphasize the here and now in which the world is. The work is relevant to our time and fits in the theme after the flood. Ellen, please share your screen and go ahead. I'm going to be showing a series of paintings and drawings about my mother. Her name is Mary Holtzblatt. She's 98 years old. Um, I started working on, this is a picture of her. I had a show a couple years ago at Spurtis Institute in Chicago and she came to see it and I was really happy to have her come there because it isn't always easy for her to do. Um, so in the series, in these drawings and paintings, these are all from my perspective. So they're really about the mother-daughter relationship, but obviously I'm talking about my relationship. So there is definitely a bias. Um, and I just want to say that even though they're personal, I think that the personal, that it's by going to the personal and going deeply inward, <coughs> that we become more, that we can, we can make things more universal. And that's my, my philosophy and work in, in the work that I do. So uh, my work is not funny. So I thought I'd start with a few jokes about mothers and daughters. I haven't come to that determination yet that my mother is right about everything, but it, I do identify with the fear in the person's face. So anyway, okay, enough for the jokes. Uh, this is a painting of my mother when she was a child. Uh, there was a time, my mom would come over sometimes when I was preparing dinner, like for holidays or for Shabbat, and she always needed to have something to do. So there was one time she was over and I really didn't have anything to give her. There was nothing for her to cut up. So I said, why don't you just keep me company and tell me a story from your childhood? And what she said was my parents didn't love each other. Um, and I thought that was, an incredible thing for her to say, but uh, unfortunately, I also think it was true because my grandmother told me that she did not love her husband. Um, I never met my grandfather. He died when I was two weeks old. They had a, an arranged marriage. Um, and I think that when, um, and you'll see as I keep working, um, that I start to, when I, when I work on these images of my parents when they were younger, my mother, my father, I think about the collective unconscious, how what happened to us prior to, um, to our being born, the collective ancestral unconscious affects us in our life. It affects the actions that we take. It affects how we feel about things. I think that there's some kind of memory in our body that we carry with us. So after my father died 14 years ago, I started a series of paintings. I titled it Yizker. And this is a painting of my mother from that series. And my mother said, why am I in the series? I'm still alive. Um, she was right. She still is alive today. 
But again, I was thinking of memory, not just being about somebody passing, but also about um, the memories that they pass on to us, the things that we remember from their lives. So this one is called, I saw you across the room because my father, right before he died, he was, he talked a lot about memories in his life. And one of them was the time he met my mother. And he said it was at a dance. And he said he saw her across the room and there was just something about her. Um, I'm sorry, it's not advancing. There we go. Uh, this is called Sheva Brachot or Seven Blessings. They got married. In the refuge of the Most High, they had their first child. They had three children. And then my series started up again, working on my mother. I came back into the present. This is called uh, Like a Lily Among Thorns. And I started to name the paintings of my mother based on with quotes from Shir Hashirim because, from Song of Songs, because I, my mother was a person who isolated herself a lot. Um, and I felt sad for her. And I felt sad that she didn't trust the people around her, my sister and I, who were there for her. Um, and I also recognize that as somebody ages, as they get older, they still need the intimacy. I mean, Shir Shireem is obviously it's very sensual. It's about, it literally is about two lovers. Um, it is metaphorically about the relationship between the people of Israel and God, but it is such a sensual poem that I think that, that as we age, we still have that need for intimacy, that need for touch, the need to connect with others. This is Mary, <clears throat> Mary in her room. She went through a stage in her life where she was living in an apartment that we could not, she didn't have any help. She was in her 90s. Um, we would try to reach her. Sometimes it would be a couple hours and we couldn't get a hold of her. There was no front desk where we could call to, to find out if she was okay. And my sister and I would like suddenly run over to the apartment, drive furiously over there. And I just, again, felt sad that she was choosing to isolate herself like that. And that's where this painting came from. Uh, this came from the same place. It's called My Beloved. And this is Love is as Fierce as Death. Then the pandemic came. So when the pandemic started, my mother was living in independent living. So there was more help but she wasn't going down to meals. Um, she was alone in her apartment all the time. Her contact with the outside world, she didn't have a caregiver. Her contact with the world was my sister and me. And we made a decision. They, they said that they were gonna close off the building, not allow any family members to come. And we couldn't imagine how she was gonna be able to live alone like that. So we made a decision to take her out and she came and lived with me. Um, well, at least temporarily. She was living with my sister for part of the time, and, but she came initially to live with me. Um, so the beginning of the pandemic was um, my mother in my house with the news on, blasting because she couldn't hear. I couldn't get to my studio. I was We didn't know what was happening at that time. We didn't know how the, uh, the virus was transmitted. So I was cleaning constantly to protect her. I was washing my hands constantly. I didn't touch her. Um, that, so that again, started to become a theme in our lives, how there was this separation between us, this lack of that we were together, but we couldn't really be together. I couldn't console her throughout this. Um, this, this, the first, when I finally was able to go back to my studio, because I, at that time I had a studio that was in a shared building. I didn't want to go. I didn't, we had shared bathrooms. We had a shared sink. I didn't know if I was going to be bringing something back to her. So I finally did go back after a couple of months and this was the first painting I made. It's called A Day. And then what became really important during the pandemic were, was my sketchbook because I couldn't get to my, my studio all the time. So I started to work in my sketchbook. Um, this is a series, these are four of the sketches I did of my mother, four pages. But I drew landscapes, I drew my father, I was, I had an, uh, a residency at the Chicago Artists Coalition, so I was doing drawings that were based on things for the residency. Everything was on Zoom, of course. And then there was the fact that she couldn't cut her hair. She always had this short hair, and suddenly her hair was getting long and it was really free and it was kind of enlightening for me to see that. 
So last summer, there was one day she, we were outside in the yard at my sister's house and her hair was just blowing in the wind and it was, the light was hitting against it. And uh, I did a couple of drawings based on that. This is called Until the Day Breathe. And this is called Garden. They're both ink on paper. Uh, this is the last painting I did of her in the Kern series. This is called, again, it's from, um, this is also titled from Shira Shireen. And this is called, I Saw It The One I Love. It's uh, 48 by 36. Um, here, let me, this is a close up of the figure. It was based on a, a photograph that I had of her where she was holding my dog. You know, during this whole time, she she always loved my the dog, my sister's dog, my dog, and my dog happened to be agreeing to sit in her lap, and she was holding him, and there was something just so beautiful about seeing her hold the dog, and get that intimacy that she needed from the dog, but also it brought back memories for me of our relationship, which has not always been an easy one. I mean, now we are. I am partially her caregiver, so I we have to have that kind of intimate relationship, but it hasn't always been that way. Um, and I thought about her holding and holding her children, holding herself. And this is the last painting I'm gonna show you. Um, I started this one actually um, in 2014, and I worked on it about five or six times. It's gone through many iterations over the years. I think I'm done now. But I've said that before and I've been wrong, so who knows, it might be continuing. This is called um, The Earth Was Wild and Waste, and it is a painting of my mother as myself, in a way. That's kind of how I, maybe the second title would be Portrait of the, uh, of the Artist as Her Mother. I started it um, as working with my mother when she was the same age as me, and, um, and then she uh, you know, obviously that's not the case now, but when I started it, that was, she was the same age that I was at that time. Um, it's my body, my hands, it's my landscape that I was standing in, in a beautiful place in Maine. It's not a place that she has been to, but I think that there's a sense of when you get to learn to accept yourself, to be who you are um, as a person in this world, you have to also be able to love the people who are there for you. I need to, you know, on a pers very personal level, I have to resolve my issues with my mother so that I can also love myself. Um, and I wanted to just share, uh, end with just a little stanza from a poem. It's called Mother, A Cradle to Hold Me by Maya Angelou. I'm just doing the first stanza. It's a long, much longer poem. It is true I was created in you. It is also true that you were created for me. I owned your voice. It was shaped and turned to soothe me. Your arms were molded into a cradle to hold me, to rock me. The scent of your body was the air, perfumed for me to breathe. Anyway, I also would like, before I end, just like to thank Judith and Dorit very much for um, allowing me to be here today and to the Jewish Art Salon and to Yona and all of you for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, this was fantastic, astonishing. I love your work, Ellen, and you know that I always say that. And everybody wants to ask question, Ellen, is the time now. I just want to say that I love the space you leave. Uh, always you leave some space above the figure of your mother and the way she merged into the landscape or the sky. So the background is just fantastic. Thank it's you. something uh, to think about. You, know. you want to say something about it? about the uh, the sky and the melting. I do think about that. Um, that started when I was working on Like a Lily Among Thorns. And as I was working, I realized that, that because that one was, it was actually a painting. Um, my mother was in a hospital room, sitting in a bed, looking out at a view that was basically of the roof of the hospital. Um, but there was this beautiful light coming in and I photographed her. She didn't know I was photographing her. She thought I was playing games on my phone. But um, I realized that as I was working on that painting that it started to become part of the, of the sky. And I do, you know, I don't want to really say more than that. I'm really kind of happy for people to sort of impose their own feelings, but I did feel like that became an important part of the painting and it did continue with other work. Beautiful, beautiful paintings. 
I'd like to comment on that one too, because I saw it from the beginning and I've seen the changes that it went through. And it's really interesting to me, the emotional tone that that painting, the journey it's taken, and it's at a kinder place now, I think. It's, it's, it's more peaceful than it was, um, which is really interesting. So I'm happy for you, <laughs> but that's what the painting is expressing. It's wonderful. Thank you. We do have a couple of questions. Um, Sylvia asked about it, whether you work uh, about, from photographs and you just referred to that. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, you know, when I first started working from photographs, it felt funny to me because I was, a, I used to be a figurative artist years ago and I always would work from life. But the work that I'm doing now, I couldn't do from life. Um, when I started painting figures, you know, doing paintings of my father, you know, he wasn't alive anymore. And I had to work with very little tiny black and white photographs from when he was younger. Um, but also I found it gave me a freedom because I, they weren't limited to the space that they were in in, in life. I, they could go to the space that it felt like right for me to put them in. Like in the refuge of the most high, they're sitting on a park bench in Paris that I found online because they went to Paris once and I, they never really traveled a lot. So I thought, that's where I want them to be. I don't want them to be in a, you know, in a dark room in their apartment. I want them to be in Paris. So it kind of does give me freedom. And my mother can never sit for me that much now. She would not be able to sit that long. She's 98. So wow. thank you for the question. And there was another question from Beth Haber. She wanted to know about your medium, if you work in oil. Yes, I do work in oil um, and the Surf, I don't use um, a medium. I just use oil straight. The only medium I use is maybe a little bit of damsel with it. Um, and then I work on linen, sometimes on panel, but usually on linen, sometimes stretched linen, sometimes linen mounted on panels. Wonderful. Dorit, are we ready to go on to uh, William Kentridge? What do you think? If nobody else want to ask something, then we can uh, keep it uh, after uh, the last presentation by Leah and yeah, we can go on. Okay, I think we got all your questions, Ellen, and you have many comments in the chat, and I'll send that to you today, later. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Okay, so um, we have for you a video by William Kentridge, and uh, this was Dorit's idea to include this, and I was very enthusiastic because I'm a huge fan of his work. Um, William Kentridge was born in Johannesburg, South Africa in 1955. So he's our generation, for those of us who are that age. Uh, he is Jewish. His parents were successful and wealthy professionals, and both were active in the anti-apartheid movement. He is internationally acclaimed for his drawings, films, theater, and opera productions. His method combines drawing, writing, film, performance, music, theater, and collaborative practices to create works of art that are grounded in politics, science, literature, and history, yet maintaining a space for contradiction and uncertainty. We're going to show a seven minute video that he created. And also I included in the chat, a link to another video of a work that I saw at the Milwaukee Art Museum. It was also in other places. It was a huge installation that had multiple screens and it's mind blowing. So there are many videos online by Kentridge and I encourage you to explore them. So let's take a look. Judith put the sound on and full screen. Sorry.
the next artist, Leah Rabb, was born in New Jersey and began her art studies at the University of New Hampshire. She received a BFA with honors from the Bezalel Academy in Jerusalem. And during COVID-19 pandemic, Leah's painted sense of outdoor prayers, praying in isolation and the getting the vaccine. Go ahead, Leah, share your screen. Okay, does everybody see? Yes. Okay, first of all, thank you so much to the Jewish Art Salon, to Yona, Dorit, and Judith for the opportunity to share my work. After going with the flow during three lockdowns, limited mobility for fear of coming in contact with the virus, we learned to appreciate things we took for granted. We navigated Zoom meetings and other online forums. I attended weddings, funerals, prayer services, and other gatherings online. People and places in my life shrunk to tiny images. Back in 2020, before the vaccine, I painted many scenes of outdoor prayer. Many of them were self-portraits. After praying for a miracle, the vaccination became available in Israel. For me, the theme after the flood represented the rush of vaccinations that flooded Israel. In 2021, soon after I received the vaccination, I began to paint my impressions of the experience. I portrayed myself staring straight ahead stiffly, afraid to look at the needle, yet the bright pink color symbolized an air of relief and optimism and almost a forced sense of enthusiasm by its syrupy sweet color. Pink also suggests healing and the insides of the body. People flock to vaccination centers all over the country, hoping it would finally bring an end to the pandemic. Some shared their photos with me and revealed that it was a spiritual moment for them. I had been focusing more on portraits, so I became intrigued by these intimate moments. Some people actually recited blessings when they received the vaccine. The blessing of Matira Surim was said, Hashem sets free those who are imprisoned. Or Shehachianu, he has allowed us to live, has preserved us and has enabled us to reach this season. Some recited the bracha of Hatov v'hametiv used on occasions of great joy and celebration. Blessed is the Lord who is good and bestows good. Receiving the vaccination was a momentous occasion for some. Blessings recited with God's name are taken very seriously to avoid using his name in vain. The upper arm is an area of the body that is not usually exposed in public, especially in some religious circles. This was a very private moment when one was in a very vulnerable position. So I was very careful not to divulge their names. I wanted to capture the atmosphere in the room and different reactions to the experience. There was much uncertainty and trepidation. Some people are still very much against getting vaccinated while others have already taken the third vaccine which just became available in Israel on Friday. By springtime, restrictions were finally lifted. After the flood of vaccinations, people were finally reuniting. It's been a challenging year with elections, many demonstrations, missile attacks, and new strains of corona. Amid the conflict, we see diverse types coming together on one screen, each from a different world within each square, uniting as one. May we all experience a regenesis. May we develop more understanding and compassion to bring about healing and harmony. And that's it. I, I cut out a lot of other paintings because of the new format. So I, I that's it. Well, it was great. And actually uh, don't feel bad about that because 
you presented a lot. <laughs> and I loved the Zoom one at the end of the Jewish Art Salon because I recognized people. That was unbelievable. Yeah. Let's see that one again. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're just like little quick sketches, but I can pick out Dorit and it looks like Dor Diana Kurtz and maybe me. And <laughs> it's wonderful. With the art and the bird. <laughs> Oh, it's just, it's fantastic. And I did say Shahekianu, so I, I relate to that. Yeah. What an incredible uh, document. And and um, it's it's just so interesting the way you took this, this simple act that's kind of uh, the new normal for us and you made it such an interesting series. Well, it was strange. It was a strange kind of portrait. And it was almost like voyeuristic. I, I had to say, you know, everybody got their vaccination behind closed doors and I couldn't be there, but people were sending me their pictures and some didn't want to be named, but some were proud and some wanted me to do paintings with them. So um, I felt, I felt very, you know, unfortunately I couldn't stand there with my easel and paint them as they were getting vaccinated, but I felt very fortunate that I had a glimpse into their world, into what they were experiencing. And, you know, like I said, it was a very private moment, but I had access to it because they sent me their pictures. So did you put out a call, a request for the photos on Facebook or something? How did that work? Any friends just ask people. Yeah, very informally. I didn't press them. I, you know, only if they wanted to. It was a great idea. I took a picture of my husband. He was, he was like, what? When he was getting his shot, because he got his before me. He didn't understand, but I, I understand. It's a moment in time, it's history. Yeah, what's, what's amazing by that is also that it's a painted documentation. It's usually we used to have this documentation by photography and video. And here we got like really a, a moment of those people get vaccine. And I, I know all your prayers paintings that are also amazing. All these uh, high holidays with all the people outside at the playgrounds with the talitot and everything. It's fantastic. I love your work. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Leah, can you go back to the pink painting? Mm -hmm. I'd love for us to talk about that a little bit because that um, really was so unusual in your, in, you know, it really stands out in your uh, portfolio. I've never seen you use color like that. So I, I appreciate your explanation. Um, and I think it does. It's so interesting because it brings up a lot of uh, kind of uh, disconnects and um, unease that we feel right now. It's like you want to love it. You want to love that color, but part of you like rebels against it. Yeah. Very interesting choice. I was also the most connected to this painting because it was my experience. It was personal. And I couldn't be at the other vaccinations. Maybe if I had been there, I could have, you know, felt more, <laughs> more felt, you know, it, it would have been a different experience. But this was mine. This was very personal. And, and you lit it up with this electric color. So we feel that, you know, that there's an extra charge there of the fact that it's your own experience. It's just, um, it's a very interesting way to use color to tell a story. I love the narrative element in your work. And that's something that sometimes people don't think about is how color alone can, can really tell a lot of story. Mm -hmm. I have a question, La, about the, the theme of, the, of, this of this program after the flood. It seems that it's in the middle of the flood yet yeah, in, in those paintings. How do you feel about that? So when I first started this presentation, it was after the flood. We all thought that after the vaccination, Corona was a thing of the past. We thought we beat it. We thought it was after the flood and everybody would resume normal activity or whatever was normal. Everybody would reunite, everybody would, you know, <clears throat> would, would um, appreciate everything that they had to give up for a year. And it wasn't that way at all. There was a lot of, there was a lot of conflict. Like I said, there were a lot of demonstrations. Um, we're, we're, and now another, another 
you know, another variant and, and more, more vaccines. I, I was hoping it would be after the flood, but unfortunately we're still in it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it is, it is. You know, there is this, uh, this uh, banner that goes in Israeli WhatsApps. I don't know if you got it. It's like a, uh, it's like a bus that you can, uh, you have 10 rides in a bus, a ticket. Yeah, I saw that. You saw that, of course, right? So yeah, can you, I don't know how to uh, explain this because it's all in Hebrew, but it's, it's really uh, showing yeah. what the mood in Israel is about the, getting another vaccine now. So it's, it's uh, like uh, you get 10 and one free or something like that. When you go on a bus, you don't have to pay, you have a ticket. And they right. punch a card every time you take a ride. And so they did the same thing with the vaccine as a joke, that you punch the card every time you get another vaccine. I actually pulled that up on my screen. If um, you stop share for a moment, Leah, I'll share it. So everyone can see what Dorit is talking about. Okay. Uh, so you sent this to me, Dorit, and I thought it looked like a bus ticket, but then I thought, is this really something that, that Pfizer is using? I didn't really get it, but that's, yeah, that's the yes, meme. This is like a, a bus ticket for 10 rides, but here it's for 10 uh, vaccines. And yeah. it's uh, uh, valid till 2022. Oh, so God. Catch the bus. Yeah, we really hope that we won't be still riding that bus for 10 rides. That's really a something we don't want to be doing. Um, I just uh, want to consider the three artists that we looked at today because there are a lot of common grounds. And um, I wonder if anybody wants to comment on that. And let's see, we've got 50 people. I think if, if you want to just unmute and jump in, I think that could work. Or you could put your question or comment in the chat. Yeah, Joel, usually you say something. You want me to? Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Go okay. Ahead. Um, I think, I, you know, I, I knew Ken Rich's work for many, many years, but the two artists who showed today, I know personally both. There's really a wonderful crossover. First of all, they're both very talented as painters. Um, you know, they're really good traditional kind of expressionist painters. But I think there's also this interesting aspect of reportage, like emotional reportage, that's uh, kind of rare in contemporary art today, which I, I really appreciated. Um, Ellen, about her mom and Leia, about the pandemic, it was this kind of like crisis or existential kind of situation they were responding to, both use photography, but only because it's the kind of situation where you can't sit there and do stuff on, on site. Uh, but they use photography in a very informed way. And because they're very gifted painters, um, the paintings are informed through photography, but they don't just mimic photography. They're, they're kind of interpreted in a very personal way. And they have a lot of resonance, uh, both artists, you know, all three, but I mean, Cambridge is not here for me to talk to, but. Um, so I just want to compliment everyone today. It's just very, it's wonderful to see um, you know, this is the Jewish art salon, there are Jewish themes going on, but it, they're wonderful paintings and you can see the Jewish influence, but they're not mere illustrations. You can see very heartfelt responses to emotional situations. And to be able to do that in painting is, is still very encouraging. So thank you. thank you. Wonderful comment, Joel, thanks for that. Um, does anybody else wanna um, yeah, comment on this? Okay, I'll take a shot of this. Go ahead, Gloria. Thank you. Um, I think the presentation in, at large was excellent. I think each artist uh, made it very intimate and very personal and uh, very complex. I mean, feelings and ideas uh, of the first artist was amazing. We all experienced stuff like that. We all know about stuff like that, but not all of us express it in an artistic way. Um, the book was exceptional. Uh, I have seen his work before, but I've never seen 
the book. Uh, to me, it was, if you, if any of us, I mean, I've, done, I've made books, but this was above all uh, a, a confrontational experience, a, a way to both experience the time of pages turning and also experience the issues that he brings before us. And I, I was very moved. And of course the um, vaccine has been in our life now for seven, eight months. And it's been a very difficult process for each and every one of us. So what I see at this presentation is how the personal really is expressed beautifully in the art and the artists that you chose. Thank you. Thank you, Bruria. Um, I just wanted to throw in that um, I've watched the Kentridge video several times and something struck me this time that I just hadn't really thought about before. And I think it's because I watched it after seeing Ellen's presentation, which was that it was a dictionary and you got to um, proceed through the alphabet and that really any other book would not have given you quite that exact sense of time. And it made me think, what letter am I on? You know, I hope I'm on M. I'm probably more on P at least in my life. And, and then transitioning from that to Leah's work about, um, you know, the fragility of our lives right now, you know, thematically, I think that was amazing. And I give Dory credit for that because you put that together. Um, but it really, it, it's, it's a memento mori, as they say in art history, you know, a, a kind of a contemplation of mortality. So we have a little uh, time left because I really wrote the assistance of uh, William Kentridge and I asked, maybe he can come and talk a little bit about his work, but of course I didn't get any answer so far. <laughs> Who knows, maybe I'm gonna get one day and then we're gonna do a new uh, screening with him, hopefully. So we have a little more time so we can use this for a discussion about the works and be free to jump in. Yeah, I, um, I'd like to um, um, sort of second what Joel said. I, I'm so glad to see painting like real painting, so much of what you see now on Instagram and Facebook and certainly in the galleries is not really painting. I have nothing about um, against computers. I love them, but there's so much computer art. And so it's so refreshing to see painting that does deal with the real world. And also what I like very much, again, this is a matter of contrast, that I found the work very, very positive, all three of them, even though you know one deals with aging and the other one deals with illness and Kentridge, which is about the passage of time. It was a pleasure that the work was not cynical. One sees so much cynicism in the art world, at least in New York. And I personally am so glad to see what we what you showed today. And thank you so much. It sort of brings back faith in painting again, that painting is still alive, very much alive. So, um, Amen to that. Mm. And, and, and you're right up there with the best of the painters. So it's, yeah. it's great hearing from you, Diana. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> we know. Oh, thank you, everybody, for joining Actually, us. Can I, Dory, can I just say something really quick? No, I just want to just say uh, thank you again. But I, I really did love your paintings. Uh, Leah, they were just beautiful and that you could I put in the comment but that you could take something that one would think of as mundane and medical and and you really you brought so much emotion to them and I did I love the way you painted I always love when you could you know see the mark of the creator in the work and definitely could feel that so it was a pleasure to show with you today thank you so much I've been an admirer from afar I never met you and I've seen your work over the years and I love your work. So coming from you, it's a very big compliment. I love your work and I, and I can identify with it, the mother-daughter thing, um, because I did a series about my mother too. And um, it was beautiful. It, it really made me cry. It was beautiful. 
Well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah. And I, I, I also want to take the Jewish Art Salon because without this forum, we, we wouldn't have the dialogue, you know, being in touch with one another, especially during the pandemic, it's, it's such a gift. I look forward to it each time, you know, just to be able to see other people and see what they're doing and see the art that people are creating. I, I just love being in touch with all of you. It's wonderful. It's inspiring. Well, I'm glad you said that because it's a perfect segue to think about the next program, which will be uh, September 5th with Joel Silverstein, Diana Kurtz, and Jacob Jeanan. I will have to find out how he pronounces his name. Uh, we look forward to seeing you, and um, I, I want to thank the artists for their fabulous presentation today. Leigh and Ellen, your work is amazing, and we love it, and I'm, we're glad that we could share it with everybody else too. So we look Thank forward you. to seeing everybody uh, on September 5th. See you then. <laughs>